Okay, everybody. So welcome to our talk today. Uh, my name is Christian Pais. I'm an assistant professor in the Ethnic Studies Department, and I am the convener or director of the speaker series uh, where Professor Cynthia Young will be speaking today. So let me, uh, I'm going to give a little introduction to both the, the talks and then to Professor Cynthia Young. Uh, I'll take a few minutes. Uh, we'll go about it slowly just so that we're not overwhelmed at the beginning of this talk. So first of all, the Race, Ethnicity, and Immigration Colloquium invites speakers from the Berkeley campus and other institutions to share research touching on various aspects of race, ethnicity, and immigration. And this REI colloquium is situated under the Institute of Governmental Studies. Uh, one important theme explored by the colloquium is the changing shape of ethnic politics in the country. A second closely related theme is the impact of immigration on the nation and on California's political and economic life. Uh, you can read up a little bit more on the colloquium on the website. We'll be sharing that on the chat box. Uh, this is all just to say that we're thrilled that you're with us. We, we hope to have uh, lectures that are pertinent to our society and that offer us ways out of the current predicaments that we often find ourselves in. Uh, these colloquia are open to all members of the campus community. Uh, this lecture is being uh, co-sponsored by the Center of Race and Gender and by the Comparative Ethnic Studies Program in the Ethnic Studies Department. Um, if you have not already looked at their websites, please do so. They have fantastic speakers as well. So today's speaker is Professor Cynthia Young, a professor whose work I have read for many years now and whose work I have been uh, building uh, or in conversation with in my classes and in my own work. So we're, I am incredibly thrilled that you're with us today. Uh, professor uh, Young is the, an Associate Professor of African American Studies in English and then the head of the Department of African American Studies at Pennsylvania State University. Uh, her first book uh, authored, uh, her first book uh, titled Soul Power, Culture, Radicalism and the Making of the U.S. Third World Left and here it is, and you'll see that mine is a used copy. So uh, if you don't already have this, I suggest that you do go ahead and get it. Uh, it looks at the influence of the third world anti-colonialism on activists, writers, and filmmakers of color in the 1960s and 1970s. The project earned her fellowships from the Ford and Mellon Foundations, and rightfully so. Uh, she is the author of articles, reviews, and short essays, all of which are listed on her, on her uh, uh, or website. Uh, she's also recently the co-edited with Min Sung a forum for American Quarterly entitled Whiteness Redefine or Redux. Her current manuscript, Terror Wars Dash Culture Wars, Race, Popular Culture, and the Civil Rights Legacy of 9-11, considers the contours of popular culture and contemporary discourse in the wake of the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Of particular interest are the questions of Black citizenship, and immigrant exclusion. She considers a range of texts in order to decipher how African Americans are being reinscribed as ideal citizens in contrast to new Asian, Arab, Latino, and Latina immigrants who are positioned as inherently suspicious and inassimilable. The project has been supported by the fellowship at Harvard University's Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History. For today's talk, titled Shock Jocks, the Radical Right and the Roots of Trumpism, uh, Professor Young will examine the deeper roots of Trumpism, xenophobia, and white supremacy, arguing that President Trump benefited from a wave of white fear and anger rather than originating it, tracing the origins of our current U.S. culture of intolerance and fear back to the 9-11 and the election of President Obama. This talk considers the role of shock jocks, the Tea Party, and the radical right groups in fueling white hatred and fear. Now, the, um, I, I, I know that you're all here. Uh, if it's possible, please do the little clappy thing so that Professor Young knows that we are thrilled to have her, that she's speaking to us from Pennsylvania, uh, but that um, her work speaks to us out here in California. So with, with that, any further ado, uh, Professor Young, the, the screen is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks goes to Christian Heiss and UC Berkeley's Race, Ethnicity, and Immigration Colloquium for inviting me to speak. And endless gratitude goes to Megan Collins for patiently shepherding me through the logistics that made this possible. Can I have slide one, please? 
person who's having some trouble sharing. So we have to tag team this. Um, and then slide two. In August, 2010, Glenn Beck was on a roll. With a popular Fox News show, a syndicated radio show, and multiple New York Times bestselling books, Beck was riding a high tide of right-wing cons conservatism. For months, Beck had been hyping his Restoring Honor rally, which was to be held at the Lincoln Memorial on the 47th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Initially, Beck denied that he'd chosen the date to correspond with the famous March on Washington, explicitly pitching the rally as political. But as the date approached, Beck switched tack, embracing what he previously dismissed as coincidence. He began to speak of the rally in general terms as an event to reaffirm faith, hope, and charity the values that made America great. As the rally drew closer, Beck warmed his theme, describing the rally as a product of, quote, divine providence, unquote, with exalted goals. Quote, we are the people of the civil rights movement, he said in one radio monologue. We are the ones that must stand for civil and equal rights, justice, equal justice. We are the inheritors and protectors of the civil rights movement. The same man who a year ago had accused President Obama of being a racist with a, quote, deep-seated hatred for white people, was now claiming the mantle of civil rights. The same commentator who was the public face of the Tea Party, a group condemned by the NAACP in a July 2010 resolution for having racist elements, was now positioning himself as the protector and inheritor of civil rights. So the question is, how do we get here? Over the next 45 minutes, I hope to answer that question, describing how Beck, facilitated by right-wing media, the Tea Party, and right-wing militias, created the toxic cultural muck out of which President Trump and Trumpism emerged. Trump campaigned on and popularized the sentiment that the US way of life and white men have been forced into a defensive crouch by liberalism, feminism, socialism, or communism, or simply the mainstream media. White fortunes were declining while undocumented immigrants and Black Lives Matter activists were thriving. But before there was a President Trump, there was a Glenn Beck, who sounded many of Trump's themes well before insurrection became part of our political lexicon. The difference is that in the first decade of the 2000s, Beck felt the need to couch his racism and xenophobia in civil rights era rhetoric, hence the claiming of Martin Luther King Jr.'s mantle, a maneuver that has since been adopted by the right-wing movement writ large. In 2015, at a summit hosted by the Koch brothers that included Senators Cory Gardner, Mike Lee, Ben Sass, Tim Scott, and Dan Sullivan, Charles Koch said, Look at the American Revolution, the anti-slavery movement, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, Koch said. All of these struck a moral chord with the American people. They all sought to overcome an injustice. And we too are seeking to right injustices that are holding our country back, unquote. This from the man who's funded the John Birch Society, voter suppression efforts, union busting, and other activities that disproportionately impact black Americans. Drawing such equivalences demonstrates just how ordinary the yoking together of white victimhood, racism, xenophobia, and the civil rights legacy has become. Glenn Beck's rise coincided with and was facilitated by the 9-11 attacks. Obama's subsequent election, heralded in those days as evidence that the US was quote, post-racial, unquote, fueled the rise of the Tea Party and so-called patriot groups, constituencies forged by anti-black racism, xenophobia, and an abiding sense of white victimhood. These elements define Trumpism and the contemporary Republican Party, for that matter, which has been captured by its millionaire circus Barker. It's customary to read the right wing's freedom talk, currently prominent in its opposition to vaccine mandates, as a way of linking themselves to the founding fathers. But I want to suggest over the next 45 minutes that freedom has also been central to right wing discourse because of its powerful link to the civil rights era. Then, in the civil rights era, freedom was a synecdoche for human rights, electoral participation, and end to state violence against black and brown people. Now, freedom is a way of casting virulent racism and nativism in rhetoric associated with anti-racism. This, I contend, was a central hallmark of 21st century radical discourse until Trump shed its civil rights gloss to show its naked white supremacy. Next slide, please. There we go. This talk consists of three parts. As you can see here, in part one, I identify the 9-11 attacks as a seminal event that made available, again, to white Americans the language of victimhood. 
Part two looks at the armed radical right and the Tea Party, describing how racism and nativist sentiments stoked their growing popularity, reflecting and spreading white fears of being swamped, in quotes, by racial and ethnic hordes. And part three focuses on the rise of Glenn Beck and his use of civil rights rhetoric to advance a racist, xenophobic, anti-immigrant cultural and political agenda. That rhetoric made more palatable sentiments that since the 1970s, white people covertly held more, pa more palatable. This civil rights gloss repurposed that movement's legacy to forward an agenda at odds with human rights and humane immigration and asylum policies, and in fact, diametrically opposed to the freedom dreams that animated the civil rights movement. This rhetorical and narrative strategy made Republican politicians and the white people who elected them increasingly more comfortable saying the quiet part out loud. In the first decades of the 21st century, the 9-11 attacks and subsequent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan laid the foundation for a resurgence in US imperial ambitions. They also laid the groundwork for a resurgence in white anxiety, both because 9-11 was a highly symbolic and devastating attack, but also so because that same decade including the start, included the start of two never-ending wars, the 2007-2008 global financial crisis, and then the election of the first black president. Costly and bloody imperial wars and the global financial crisis accelerated ever-widening racial, economic, political, health, and educational gaps. Those gaps, combined with significant cultural shifts, have hastened the remaking of white identity as uniquely vulnerable and victimized in the 21st century. Next slide, please. Central to this white racial formation were the September 11, 2001 attacks on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. Spectacularly visual in nature and covered by a 24-7 news cycle, 9-11, or rather the media's coverage of it, laid the groundwork in which the myth of a uniquely imperiled white identity could take hold. US media, and this I'm talking here about left, right, and center, depicted 9-11 as a traumatic and world redefining event. It was widely described as a senseless, apolitical act, one that inexplicably targeted innocent Americans. The telegenic nature of the World Trade Center attacks burned images of the collapsing towers and an ash-filled ground zero into a generation's collective consciousness. Next slide, please. The narrativizing of the 9-11 dead as blameless victims and heroic first responders, and on the other hand, the demonizing of the terrorists as fanatical Muslims who hated America, quote, because of its freedoms, unquote, ushered in the reframing, the reframing of the US as a homeland rather than a nation. I mean, my specialty is 20th and 21st century um, history, but I don't believe that homeland was ever used um, as a term prior to 9-11. I haven't found any examples of it. It is a term that is uh, broadly used in Israel and there's a very close connection between Israel and the US after this attack um, that was sort of cemented. Um, the trauma <clears throat> in terms of using the term homeland, it's meant to signify that the trauma was at once personal, a home invasion and collective. We were all targets now. The popular media's failure to locate the attacks within the global context of US imperialism obscured the fact that populations in the Middle East and elsewhere are more vulnerable to sudden death and violent displacement because of US foreign policy than we in the US have ever been. Unspoken and disavowed was even the possibility that US foreign policy might have created the conditions in which Al Qaeda could emerge. In the months immediately after the attacks, critiques of the US and attempts to connect 9-11 to US foreign policy were deemed unpatriotic, immoral, and even reason for termination. For instance, black arts poet Amiri Baraka, who was then poet laureate of New Jersey, was asked in September 2002 to resign after reading his poem, Someone, Somebody Blew Up America, at a literary festival. This convenient, highly orchestrated media common sense forged a new take on an old American exceptionalism, representing 9-11 as a unique collective wound, one that required a, quote, therapeutic patriotism, unquote, and a, quote, war on terror to preserve the nation's standing as a preeminent symbol of democracy and freedom in the world. The idea that radical Islamic terrorism targeted US culture, not US policies or politics, and I think that's a really important distinction to hold on to because so much of the war on terror rhetoric reduces um, motivations of terrorists um, in the Arab world to uh, them just hating our freedoms and hating that we have McDonald's. And just they just don't really engage with the, the kind of political side of these groups at all. 
Um, the idea that radical Islamist Islamic terrorism targeted US culture, not US policies, enabled the surface invocation of the US as tolerant of multiculturalism. So President George W. Bush praised Muslim Americans in the wake of 9-11, while also allowing white people to believe that they were targeted for who they were, quintessential Americans. Where the civil rights movement demonstrated that white rights and privileges, you know, access to federally subsidized housing, public education, and public parks, came at the expense of black people, 9-11 allowed white Americans to reimagine themselves as collective vi victims of global terror, irrational hatred, and religious persecution. 9-11 became a powerful way for whites to lay claim to victimhood at a historical moment when that had largely been foreclosed to them. 10 years after 9-11, a public value survey conducted by the Public Religious Research Institute captured altered views on racism in quote, real targets. Next slide, please. So you can see that um, sort of based on party affiliation, um, and I'm sorry, I'm looking at two screens um, just to make it easier for myself. Um, and then based on, so based on party, also based on identity, there's um, a growing sense amongst whites and amongst Republicans and certainly amongst the Tea Party um, that discrimination against whites is now a bigger problem as minority, as now as big a problem as minority group discrimination. Um, and of course, the people who most subscribe to this view are Fox News um, viewers. This culturally magnified sense of white vulnerability coincided with a rapidly changing demographic context that threatened to make whites of European descent a statistical minority by mid-century. Faced with this, whites across the political spectrum showed themselves, and they still do, to be susceptible to a defensive white racism. For example, a 2014 study, next slide please, published by social psychologists Maureen Craig and Jennifer Richardson, found that a nationally representative sample of white Americans exhibited in quotes, pro-white and racially biased attitudes when made aware of the nation's shifting racial demographics. The greater the perceived threat to white privilege and power, the larger the spike in racist sentiment toward all racial minorities, even towards those groups, and this is sort of key, such as Asians and black Americans who had nothing to do with the changing demographic. Um, as you can see from this slide, you know, the questions they ask, um, are, are pretty kind of straightforward um, and people pretty straightforwardly clearly sort of made their views known and it very much broke out along um, black and white lines. Next slide, please. The other thing that's interesting is that even when they assuaged um, status threat fear, so even when they um, did various things to reassure white people that they weren't going to lose status, um, it didn't actually shift at all their sense um, of anxiety. Um, next slide, please. Part two, the radical right rises. One indicator of this increasingly defensive stance on the part of white people was a historic rise in hate groups. A 2011 Southern Poverty Law Center report estimated that active hate groups had risen from 602 in 2000 to over 1,000 in 2011. Next slide, please. So this is just, this goes all the way to 2015, as you can see. Um, it just kind of gives you a sense of sort of the peak years. I hope that you can see that. Um, 2011, 2012. Um, starts to dip in 2013, then rises again in, in 2015 and peaks yet again during Trump's administration. What began as 884 active groups at the end of the George W. Bush presidency was up to 1,018 by the end of Obama's first term. Participation in hate groups dipped a bit in the intervening years until peaking again in the middle of the Trump presidency um, and in 2018. Importantly, what seemed like an unprecedented spike Next slide, please. Um, at the end of the presidency of George W. Bush has now become the floor. Oh, wait, I might be out of sequence. Can you go to the next slide? I feel like there's one. That's the one I wanted, thank you. Um, active US hate groups have never again gone below 800. Uh, whereas, you know, you saw at the beginning, they were much lower than that. Next, so now I need to go back to that hate map. Um, just to give you, if you go to the um, Southern Poverty Law Center's hate map, you can find your state as well as a breakdown of groups that are active there. And you can search, it's sort of a fascinating tool. I kind of go down a rabbit hole when I go to it. Um, 
I found out, or I guess I was reminded, because I did know this, that Pennsylvania, my home state, is number three in the nation with 36 active groups. So it's it's larger than any of its neighboring um, in any of its neighboring states, but it's also the third largest in in the country, behind only Texas and California. Next slide, please, or two slides, I guess. Right. Researchers attribute this historic increase in hate groups to the growing presence of a radical right dominated by patriot groups, most of um, which are malicious. And here I'm going to stop and define my terms. Patriot groups is sort of an umbrella term for anti-government, conspiracy-minded groups of three sort of main types. Militia is the largest segment, about which I'll say more in a minute. The tax protest movement, a 1960s era movement of people who believe that federal, state, and local taxes are unconstitutional. And three, the sovereign citizen movement. And this one, I, I don't even pretend to understand what they're saying, but they believe that the US government was infiltrated in 1860 and thus seek to become sovereign and declare themselves loyal to the pre-1860 US government. What unites all three is a belief, as I said, that the federal government has been infiltrated and is no longer legitimate. Militias dominate the so-called Patriot Movement. They emerged in 1993 after federal agents in Waco, Texas killed members of the Branch Davidians religious group. Militias really took off, however, after Timothy McVeigh's 1995 bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City. Injuring hundreds and killing 168 people, many of them children from the building's daycare center, McVeigh was an army vet and a member of a radical survivalist group in Michigan. Like their fellow patriots, militias harbor anti-government sentiments and subscribe to conspiracy theories, which they say motivate them to conduct military style training. And many members are police officers, active duty or military veterans. Okay, so I wanted to show this picture just to give you a sense of how well armed they are, but also how organized they are. And then just to show you how much power they have to actually, you know, at at rifle point, I suppose, um, detain uh, undocumented immigrants um, until Border Patrol gets there. So they very much work with Border Patrol in, um, in the instances where they're patrolling the US-Mexico border. <clears throat> Though they emerged in the Midwest, their members are best known for sending armed patrols to the US-Mexico border. While not all patriots are white supremacists, some are even uh, BIPOC, there's little doubt that militia members are equal opportunity racists who devote much of their energy to opposing immigration reform and harassing desperate migrants crossing the border. It's also worth noting that the border between militias and other patriot, group, patriot groups can be quite porous as groups did dip in and out of extremism. As you can imagine, the, the membership and the um, activities are quite volatile, so they don't necessarily last um, and they kind of dip in and out of more violent or extreme behavior. Um, one more slide, please. As it did with all hate groups, oh, no, go back one, sorry. I'm, I'm slightly out of order. The election of President Obama revived a dying movement with the number of groups skyrocketing from 149 in 2008 to 512, 512 in 2009. By the year 2011, Patriot groups had more than doubled to 1274. Though they are responsible for an increasing number of terrorist attacks on US soil, and this has periodically gotten mainstream media attention and then it just kind of gets dropped. Um, <clears throat> the real story here is not so much the expansion of the radical right as it is the mainstreaming of it over the 20 years since 9-11. In the 2020 um, SPLC extremism report, the authors note that Kyle Rittenhouse Ahmad Arbery's murderers and the Capitol insurrectionists are all indications of the fact that more and more white Americans are willing to embrace extreme tactics in the face of what they see as a threat to white hegemony. And several surveys have shown that a majority of Republicans don't believe that um, President Trump lost the election, um, which is obviously, you know, that kind of conspiracy theory is obviously um, fueling um, more and more extreme tactics as we've seen. So this mainstreaming of extremism is precisely what Trump exploited and continued to stoke during his presidency. Next slide, please. Another vehicle for the mainstreaming of racism and xenophobia was the Tea Party movement, which is widely credited with unleashing, quote, a politics of anger, unquote. 
founded in the Bush era to protest tax policy and bailout programs that were put in place in response to the 2008 economic crash, the Tea Party gained momentum after President Obama's inauguration. At its height, the Tea Party movement consisted of six primary organizations, Freedom Works Tea Party, Resist Net, Tea Party Nation, 1776 Tea Party, Tea Party Patriots, and Tea Party Express. Um, next slide, please. Tea Partiers were and still are grassroots organizers who don't really belong to any formal organization, though they bring the Tea Party perspective to a host of issues, including immigration, school curricula, city budgetary policies, and appropriate use of force by police officers. In 2010, all but Freedom Works, the most mainstream and least grassroots of this network, had so-called birthers in prominent leadership positions. Quote, in birther ranks, one Tea Party anal analysis rightly insists, an abiding obsession with President Obama's birth certificate is often a stand-in for the belief that the first black president is not a, in quotes, real American. And I'll just remind you here that President Trump spearheaded the birther movement, urging President Obama to release his long form birth certificate to prove his birthplace was indeed Hawaii. To one degree or another, the Tea Party has been a haven for racists and nativists, forging ties with various right-wing entities. ResistNet has been a hub for Islamophobes and birthers. 1776 Tea Party was linked to the Minutemen Project, which is a militia group, um, and, anti, and the anti-immigrant movement while the Tea Party Patriots are closely aligned with militias and Christian nationalists, which is, um, I, I feel, sort of the, the most recent term that we use for white supremacists. The Tea Party Express has fought numerous charges of racism, in part based on the actions and deeds of avowed anti-Semite and white supremacist Mark Williams, who was the group's first chairperson. Tea Party Nation, a Tennessee-based group, has also made alliances with birthers, or also made alliances with birthers, Christian nationalists, white separatists, and nativists, though it has also publicly opposed abortion, gay life, and anything that allegedly opposes Christian teachings. And I actually did attend a couple of these um, Tea Party rallies um, when Sarah Palin was speaking at them. Um, and you could see that it was just this like hodgepodge of incoherent ideas. And, and very often there were signs that said, this isn't about race right next to like, a depiction of Obama as a monkey on somebody else's sign. Um, or you would see um, people sort of saying things like, um, keep the government off of my social security or stuff like that. Um, or like government is tyranny if they touch my Medicare, those kinds of things. Um, so it's just like a really strange mix of folks um, and also lots of selling of racist memorabilia um, you know, it was like a tent revival in a lot of ways um, with kind of racist um, accessories, I guess. Uh, let's see. Devin Burkhardt and Leonard Seskin, authors of Tea Party Nationalism, contend, next slide please, that the Tea Party has provided platforms to anti-Semites, racists, and bigots. Hardcore white nationalists, militia members, and other extremists have been attracted to these protests, looking for potential recruits and hoping to push white protesters towards a more self-conscious and ideological white supremacy. It may be a diffuse and varied network, but Tea Party years seem to be ideologically consistent in their racism and xenophobia. Whether they see themselves as challenging mainstream Republicans or opting out of the political mainstream altogether. It's difficult to say that even this distinction holds since Trump's presidential campaign was popular with mainstream Republicans and white nationalists as reported by Evan Osnos in the New Yorker. At its height, the Tea Party's primary target was the first black president. Without a doubt, Khalifa Sine wrote in an uh, opinion piece, Obama's election was a transformative moment for white people contributing to a feeling of white disenfranchisement. Researchers Christopher Parker and Matthew Barreto argue that Tea Partiers fervently believed that President Obama was out to destroy their country and undermine its founding values. And by this, they didn't mean racism and settler colonialism. The president's blackness clearly upended some white people's sense of who can properly represent US power. So focused, irrational, and intense was the Tea Party's Obama phobia that disapproval of Obama was the strongest independent variable driving Tea Party identification in a 2013 study. Despite all their talk of the federal debt and fiscal responsibility, respondents demonstrated more vehement anti-Obama sentiment than they did fiscally conservative sentiment. If the Tea Party was motivated by a particular dislike of President Obama, 
that feeling was bolstered by an abiding racial animus and an inability, in Baratunde Thurston's words, to allow Black people, quote, to be that which they are, that is, fully enfranchised citizens. The respondents in Parker and Barreto's longitudinal study of the Tea Party expressed, expressed significant, if coded, anti-Black racism and antipathy toward immigrants, though they carefully avoided using um, overtly racist language. Opposition to immigrants from Central and South America or antipathy toward African Americans is not about race, Tea Partiers claim, but rather stems from their belief, sometimes implied, sometimes directly stated, that both groups eschew hard work and loyalty to an imagined national community. However, a 2013 study indicated that along with social conservatism, anti-minority attitudes were the most reliable predict predictor of Tea Party affiliation. Tea Party supporters oppose welfare and other social programs that they identify with minorities because they undercut so-called American values of thrift and hard work, even though the largest group, uh, racial group on welfare is white people. Echoing familiarly, familiar culturally racist tropes, tea, parties in, tea partiers in one study disguised their racial resentment in, quote, terms of more symbolic philosophical complaints about black culture, unquote, as lacking in industriousness and ambition. Black Americans, these respondents contended, have developed a dependency on the federal government. Taking the colorblind racism described in Bonilla Silva's classic Racism Without Racists to a new level, many Tea Partiers not only denied the existence of structural racism, but also see a quote, playing field tilted away from them. Researchers Christopher Parker and Matthew Barreto write, Quote, we believe that people are driven to support the Tea Party from the anxiety they feel as they perceive the America they know, the country they love, slipping away, threatened by the rapidly changing face of what they believe is the, quote, real America, a heterosexual, Christian, middle class, mostly male, white country, unquote. Next slide, please. You can see the fruit of this belief in a 2020 um, public value survey. So this is information I got in 2021, um, but it's about 2020. It's the public value survey by PRRI. And in it, Tea Partiers claim that the U.S. was post-racial, um, simply facilitated, did not, Tea Partiers claims that the U.S. was post-racial, simply facilitated denials of structural inequality and articulations of anti-Black racism and nativism as the Trump Trump presidency bore out. And so here you can see that um, there's, uh, they asked them about sentiment that the country is turning into something they don't recognize. Um, and they saw along race lines that um, Democrats, BIPOC people tended to, and you know, more democratic liberal whites tended to um, celebrate the fact that um, the US has become a more diverse nation. Um, and conservatives, mostly Republicans, um, and, and even to the right of them, um, bemoaned the fact that they had somehow been kind of pushed out of an America that sort of made sense to them. <clears throat> For Tea Party supporters, race and religion are inextricably, are inextricably bound up in U.S. nationhood. The quote, real America is a flexible signifier that can seem to include non-white citizens, even as the very definition of what constitutes the real America is racially and religiously coded. And I should say that um, I went to a march, it was called the March on Washington for um, Jobs and Freedom, I believe, um, in 2013. It was to oppose the immigration reform um, that was then um, a bipartisan effort. Um, and they had several prominent black um, speakers. Um, one of whom was also a speaker at the Capitol insurrection. And, you know, their claim was basically immigrants are trying to jump the line, right? That black people haven't gotten what they deserve. And so why should anybody else, um, you know, benefit who wasn't, you know, born here, who wasn't enslaved here, et cetera. So it's this, you know, incredibly cynical deployment of some black activists um, by these anti-immigrant um, um, entities to kind of make it seem as if this isn't about race at all. The other thing that um, was really visible at that was um, one of the things that the anti-immigrant movement really likes to focus on is um, car accidents where an undocumented person kills or badly injures um, a citizen. And so there were a few of those people who are black and there are these big kind of, I thought, macabre um, 
uh, you know, photos of their loved one, and then a bunch of kind of hate-filled rhetoric about how we need to close the borders. Tea partiers, <clears throat> participation in Tea Party events bolstered white identification through, quote, assertions of national decline and the embrace of libertarian ideology, unquote. Tea partiers have often presented themselves as untainted by racism, even as their whiteness is imagined to be the ideal form of, indeed identical to, US identity and citizenship. While it may be the case that the Tea Party drew a white race conscious, if not always overtly racist contingent, it also represented broader trends in our political and cultural formation. Based solely on membership numbers, the Tea Party was always a fringe element but several 2010 opinion polls showed that between 14 to 16% of the adult population supported them. Four years later, a Gallup poll showed that roughly one in four Republicans supported the Tea Party and nearly 45 million Americans considered themselves to be Tea Party sympathizers. The Tea Party represents a significant, and it did then, and I still think it does because they were also prominent during Trump's um, campaigns, two campaigns. The Tea Party represents a significant and increasingly vocal white middle-class constituency, even if its official membership numbers do not reflect that. And I'm gonna take a drink of water. I've been arguing thus far that 9-11, the impending minoritization of white people and the election of the first black president have provided the building blocks for a conservative white identity that sees itself as traumatized and under siege. If this white identity sees itself or as already or in danger of becoming disenfranchised, they see the nation as similarly imperiled, subject to terrorism, besieged by undocumented immigrants and experiencing a precipitous moral decline brought on by the decentering of so-called European American values and mores. In one sense, these claims are nothing new. Conservative social movements have long perpetuated the belief that their constituents were in danger of losing status and privileges if certain threats to the body politic sometimes communists, socialists, immigrants, freed slaves, were not effectively contained. The policy positions endorsed by Tea Party conservatives are also nothing new. Barely 15 years after the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, during the Reagan era, the right was already arguing that federal oversight and enforcement of civil rights law was no longer necessary. The addition of post-race rhetoric to the already toxic narrative cocktail of undeserving black people and an imperiled white nation has, however, facilitated the articulation of a extremely toxic white racial identity. The deployment of a racialized post-race discourse has made the turn to civil rights rhetoric simultaneously unfortunate and utterly predictable. Though left groups around the world have long adopted civil rights rhetoric to advance their own social justice fights, it's increasingly common for right-wing groups to use the same language to advance nativist racially coded agendas of their own. Analyzing websites, fundraising letters, speeches, advertisements, and editorials, researchers Leo, Melzer, and Reese found that US English, use for short, the largest English-only organization in the US, have utilized civil rights rhetoric highlighting model versus nightmare citizens since the early 2000s. Spanish-speaking immigrants, according to Hughes, seek to tear down the shared cultural fabric of the U.S. Hughes, in its view, is waging a defensive campaign to stop those who would rid the U.S. of its model, read white male conservative citizens. But rather than seeing this move as wholly disingenuous, it's perhaps more productive to see it as a reflection of the fact that the civil rights movement has provided the primary lingua franca for most US social and political since the 1960s. The language of equality, freedom, and justice, so compellingly articulated by civil rights activists, has been adapted by everyone from pro-life activists to animal rights groups to convey the purportedly unassailable rightness of their positions. Central to this appropriation is Martin Luther King Jr. himself. King is easily the most recognizable symbol of the civil rights movement, even by those born decades after the movement's decline. And if the civil rights movement is covered in um, secondary um, education, you know, King is gonna be mentioned during the one day that that happens. His politics have been reduced out of nonviolent protest and desegregation, de while more radical aspects of his legacy, such as the poor people's campaign and his opposition to war on Vietnam have been discarded. So in this final section, I'll demonstrate why linking Dr. King's legacy to a nativist and often racist political agenda is effective. And in the early 21st century, it was a necessary step in promoting racist views. 
In focusing on Glenn Beck's deployment of 9-11 and Martin Luther King Jr., I analyzed the contours of a form of whiteness that is distinct from and yet foundational to the one embodied in Trumpism. This whiteness is defensive, it's premised upon a sense of profound injury, but it's also offensive and pugnacious based upon a sense of white entitlement fueled by anti-Black racism, Islamophobia, and nativism. Uh, next slide, please. So part three, um, a circus clown enters the mainstream. This is Glenn Beck today. He sort of looks like Colonel Sanders, um, but that's not what he looked like in um, the period I'm talking about. So that's the next slide. By the time Glenn Beck framed his 2010 Restoring Honor rally as a civil rights rally, next slide please, he'd established himself as a prominent spokesperson for the Tea Party and the religious right. One more slide. Beck's ability to forge a media empire around his persona as a man with homespun real American values was aided by impeccable timing, huckster instincts, and canny showmanship. Beck was originally a drive time FM radio DJ in several small, mar small markets before he landed at Tampa's WFLA 90 970 in the waning days of 1999. A few months after Beck arrived at Clear Channel's WFLA, the Gore versus Bush election crisis happened and Beck had ringside seats, narrating the ins and outs of the recount from his Tampa perch. Though earlier in his career, Beck had been a libertarian who supported abortion rights and drug decriminalization, with Gore v. Bush, he emerged as a religious conservative. He'd recently at that point converted to Mormonism, um, and then he subsequently became a right-wing commentator. So successful was his right word turn that Clear Channel decided to take Beck National in September 2001. His first day on XM Satellite Radio was September 10th, where Beck did riffs on Johnny Cochran and fre frequent target, quote, race warlord Jesse Jackson using one of his dialect inflected black voices, a feature of his shtick since his earliest days in radio. In another bit, Beck pretended to claim responsibility for the lynching of African-American James Byrd, who had recently been chained to a pickup truck and dragged to his death by white supremacists in Jasper, Texas. So this is what passed for um, you know, humor and Beck content on September 10th. More often than not, Beck's radio slot showcased his anti-Black racism in the guise of humor. And then planes hit the Pentagon and the Twin Towers, a once in a lifetime opportunity for Beck. On September 11, uh, Beck opened every hour of his show with the playing of the Star Spangled Banner, punctuating listener calls with his own copious tears. So this is kind of a, you know, there's all these memes and um, he's really well known for crying essentially at the drop of a hat. Working the phones like a radio televangelist, Beck filled the airwaves with frequent references to God and country and angry diatribes against various nations. The man in me, Beck declared, would love to drop a nuke on Pakistan if they had anything to do with it. Another caller prompted this, let them see the fury of the United States when it's fully unleashed. You think we have enemies now? Wait until we take out Libya, Afghanistan, Palestine. So you can see it's like just, you know, um, scattershot attacks on uh, various nations, um, often ones with large Muslim populations. Upping the ante even further, Beck finally landed on this. Any country with ties to bin Laden, I wouldn't mind turning into a giant glowing parking lot. So that kind of really um, inflammatory rhetoric is very much the shock jock uh, in Beck. And it's also very, com you know, common in his shtick. Um, Beck's tough talk and on-air crying lasted for literally months, with Beck shuttling back and forth between the two for dramatic effect. And I'll just note here that Kyle Rittenhouse's trial testimony was a masterclass in the use of white male tears to advance a white nationalist and extremist agenda. When Dr. Laura Schlesinger refused to alter her personal advice format to satisfy the public's desire for terrorism talk, Clear Channel offered its stations The Glenn Beck Show as an alternative. And as he had with Bush v. Gore, Beck used the attacks in the subsequent war on terror to reinvent himself yet again, this time as a spokesperson for the Bush administration. He staged a series of pro-war rallies for America from March through May of 2003, featuring traditional country music, appearances by veterans and their families, and jumbotron video messages from President Bush himself. And always, always, the rallies concluded with Beck taking the stage to deliver a mashup of his greatest hits. On the heels of those rallies, Beck published his first nonfiction book, The Real America, Messages from the Heart and Heartland. Pitched as a pan to, to a time when God, country, and small town values reigned supreme, 
The introduction, the introduction describes the real America as a place in the heart, a home to which we all need to return. In that fictive world, Beck admits it's aspirational. Neighbors care about and protect one another. Into this middle American utopia, for the first time that I found, Beck inserts Martin Luther King Jr. Not to decry racism, but rather to argue that, quote, political correctness, unquote, threatens to destroy King's legacy. Beck writes, Martin Luther King's dream will come true in the real America, a colorblind society, but without political correctness. Unfortunately, King's dream has been perverted and twisted by so many white and black alike that it's barely recognizable today. In the real America, we will know that white men aren't racist. One man can be racist, black men aren't lazy, one man can be lazy, and racism is not an American problem, it's a human problem. Individual prejudice exists, but structural racism does not. This contention is exactly why Beck and so many white conservatives frequently invoke King's famous content of our character line from his I Have a Dream speech. If you isolate that from the rest of King's March on Washington speech, the line, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, can be interpreted to suggest that society should only judge on an individual ahistorical basis. Context and disparities, be they historical, political, economic, or racial, need not be taken into consideration. And to do so is to commit the sin against which King allegedly warned. And I should say at the Tea Party rallies, there were also sometimes placards with King's face on it. This deployment of King produces a distorted, inaccurate cardboard cutout version of him as an activist concerned with individual, not group progress, as a man concerned with changing hearts and minds rather than structures of white supremacy. Immediately after invoking King in the name of political incorrectness, Beck harkens back to the mythic, quote, evening of September 11th, quote, one without violence, without sorrow, without mourning. I don't understand the without sorrow or mourning part, but just as Beck would contend when he launched his September 12th movement at the end of the decade, Beck asserted that in the days after 9-11, the country was united in its care and concern for one another. His imaginary unity is bolstered by the image of the ideal citizen. You can guess what that looks like. And it also depends upon its other, that is to say, non-white and To point out that hate crimes against those presumed to be Muslim proliferated in the days after the attacks, and I should stop here and say that in the same way that attacks on Asian Americans uh, were peaking at, at a time when Trump was claiming this kind of white victimhood, that's like sort of parallel to, to what's happening in the early days after 9-11. To point out that hate crimes against those presumed to be Muslim proliferated in the days after the attacks, or that the US state detained hundreds of immigrants from Arab and Muslim countries in the wake of 9-11 was irrelevant to Beck because they were not part of his imagined community. A false image of individual black moral rectitude and white unity is cemented paradoxically through a critique of black and Middle Eastern communities. His imaginary moment of white unification depends upon a paradoxical sense of profound injury and a belief in US military might and imperial destiny is impenetrable and unstoppable. Beck's real America was governed by care and concern for one's neighbors and the homespun wisdom of an imagined rural middle America that only existed because of indigenous genocide, slave labor, and indentured servitude. What makes Beck's vision resonate is this image of domestic harmony paired with an unabashed vision of US global domination. Beck's real America is Janus faced, warm and selectively welcoming on the domestic front, but harsh and unrelenting on the international one. If King is a morally unassailable symbol of nonviolent anti-racism, then linking King to 9-11 not only allowed Beck to associate the injuries of 9-11 with those of anti-Black racism, but it also enabled him to justify violent imperial responses to that injury. It enabled the production of a mythical post 9-11 moment where we were all united behind the specter of US power, which was always coded as productive of national community, rather than destructive of other communities and nations. Beck's imagined community, however, was and still is highly selective, excluding Hollywood, political correctness, communism, which he says is disguised as liberalism, or the tolerance of sexually, sexuality related but unspecified ungodly practices, all of which he decries. Glenn Beck's rapid ascent in the first decade of the 21st century from unknown radio DJ to celebrated commentator on Fox News has been well documented as has his close affiliation with the Tea Party for whom he's, he was an unofficial spokesman. 
What has received relatively little attention is the way in which that ascent is a telling marker of a turn to a post-racial reactionary form of white identity that's dependent upon appropriating elements of civil rights history and narrating 9-11 as a world historic form of attack on white American values. In addition to deploying the real America trope, Beck has used others from the Tea Party playbook. He was an early Obama hater. He declared himself at various times to be a radical. Oh, sorry. He used other, he was an early Obama hater declaring Obama to be at various times a radical socialist, a Marxist, a quote, radical black nationalist and someone quote, out to settle old racial scores with new social justice. Beck on many occasions described the Obama administration as the incarnation of evil. No more, so, no more so than during his months long campaign in 2009 to get Van Jones, the president's newly appointed special advisor on green jobs fired. Beck's unrelenting campaign was largely responsible for Jones, Jones resigning over controversial comments he had made years earlier. As in the real America in the 2000s, Beck most often wielded Martin Luther King Jr. as a cudgel to bash bad black men and black activists. Beck's gloss for post-1968 cultural reform is the term political correctness, which he says muzzles conservatives by mistakenly calling them racist, sexist, homophobic, or nativist. Supposedly exiled from the realm of popular rhetoric and thought are a community of, in quotes, disenfranchised white people for whom Beck claims to speak. Typically, Beck did, does so by deploying rhetoric usually associated with blackness to represent whiteness. According to journalist Dana Milbank, in his first year on Fox News in 2009, Beck invoked slavery and slaves some 200 times, and it was not to describe the historic wrongs against African descended peoples. Instead, Beck argued, Obama was the engine of white enslavement. I think this President Obama's moving quickly, moving all of us quickly into slavery. He's enslaving our children with a debt that they can never repay, he once said. On September 12, 2009, when Beck held a rally to celebrate the ousting of Jones from the White House, one protester sign said, Obama's plan equals white slavery, a not infrequent Tea Party motto. Beck has also compared prosecuting white collar crime as akin to pre-civil rights Jim Crow laws. In quotes, <clears throat> African-Americans have long understood dual justice, one set of laws for whites and one for blacks. Now, according to Beck, vengeance and vigilantism was creating a dual system of justice for corporate executives. In Beck world, rich is the new poor, white is the new black. Next slide, please. 2000, 2009 was also the year that Beck founded his 9-12 project, designed, he said, to bring us back to the day after 9-11 when unity reigned. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to read this because I feel like we're short on time, but it's, it's, it's more kind of obsessing about how we were so united right after 9-11. Um, um, and how it united us across race and religious lines. He said that the 912 project was based upon these nine principles. Um, number one is America's good. And then on uh, number seven is I work hard for what I have and I will share it with who I want to. Government, government cannot force me to be charitable. The project also emphasized 12 values, including honesty, humility, charity, thrift, all staples of Christian Sunday school primers. The principles and values were at once said to be universal while being pointedly partisan. Tea Partiers swelled the ranks of the various 912 chapters and 912ers have frequently attended Tea Party rallies calling for smaller government and less taxation. And this is not surprising since Beck announced the project right on the heels of the Tea Party September 12, 2009 March on Washington. Though estimates vary widely from 60,000 to over 1 million attendees, the march was undoubtedly a show of strength by a movement that had previously been seen as marginal, if not wholly irrelevant. In October 2009, the 912 Project followed up that rally with smaller ones to protest so-called liberal media bias um, in front of local TV stations around the country. Describing that event dubbed, can you hear us now? Beck once again deployed the language of inclusion, community, and acceptance to attack those who allegedly questioned his right-wing celebration, a small government, individual responsibility, and a return to so-called traditional American values. The 912 Project and the Restoring Honor Rally held in its name really sought to revive a mythically simpler time, as I've argued. As Beck claimed in his May 26, 20, 2010 show, quote, this is going to be a moment that you'll never be able to paint people, haters, racists, none of it. This is a moment, quite honestly, that I think we reclaim the civil rights movement. It has been so distorted, so turned upside down. It's an abomination. As proof of this, Beck cited Bertha Lewis's participation in a protest against Arizona's racist SB 1070 law. 
Lewis, a black woman, was the former CEO and chief organizer of the nonprofit network ACORN, the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, which had disbanded in March of 2010 after right-wing media activists taped low-level ACORN workers appearing to encourage welfare fraud. The resulting controversy fueled by Beck, who played the tapes on Endless Loop and repeatedly interviewed James O'Keefe, the conservative who'd released the audio and videotapes, led to federal and private defunding of ACORN and its eventual demise. Lewis and the other protesters sang, we shall overcome as they were being arrested, something that supposedly outraged Beck. He railed, how dare you? So here they are singing, we shall overcome. We're not even talking about the rule of law. We're not talking about equal rights, civil rights. We're talking about modern day slavery. And that is exactly what illegal day immigration is, modern day slavery. Now, while sick, this isn't, it's not, it doesn't make sense. We're not going, well, now while we're not going to talk about the issues of illegal immigration or anything that's happening in Washington because we must repair honor and integrity and honesty first, I tell you right now, we are on the right side of history. We are on the side of individual freedoms and liberties and damn it, we will reclaim the civil rights movement. Though Beck asked attendees to leave their political signs at home, his listeners knew the score. They knew exactly who their enemies were because Beck had been identifying them for the years and months leading up to the rally. President Obama, Van Jones, Bertha Lewis, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, et cetera. Attaching Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy to his agenda was at once a nonsensical and brilliant media stunt. Beck got mainstream media coverage and raised the ire of civil rights leaders, including Al Sharpton, who held a counter de demonstration. Upping the ante in his, in his uh, linking of himself to King, in April of 2010, Beck interviewed Dr. King's niece and a staunch pro-life anti-gay marriage activist, um, Alveda King. The two discussed the 10-point nonviolent pledge, which King wrote in 1963, and Beck went on to analyze over several broadcasts in the following weeks. And I think there was some talk of if you joined 912 that you had to like, I don't know, say the pledge or, you know, sign off on the I don't know quite how that was supposed to work, but it was certainly something that he advertised. Um, at a public event in that same month, he read the pledge to his audience, saying it would shape the 912 project's next phase, and he continued to, you know, to recite it at, at rallies. <clears throat> Most recently, he tried it out for his August 2015 Restoring Unity Never Again Is Now All Lives Matter March. So that, that it's like Restoring Unity slash Never Again Is Now slash All Lives Matter March and rally held in Birmingham, Alabama in partnership with Black Pastor Jim Lowe. This time, Beck claimed to be mounting a movement of reconciliation, one designed to heal the racial wounds caused not by rampant state violence waged against Black and Brown bodies, but by the Black Lives Matter movement's protests against that racialized violence. The march began just a block from the 16th Street Baptist Church where four black girl, girls were killed by a Klan bomb and the rally featured speakers including Alveda King and Pastor Rafael Cruz, father of presidential candidate Ted Cruz, who Beck then later endorsed. One white marcher said he was there to heal a racial divide that had been caused by people who are supposed to be the non-racist people. If you pay attention, they're the ones promoting all this stuff, unquote. One could point out that Beck's talk of making the Middle East a glowing parking lot or comparing Obama to Hitler was hardly civil or nonviolent discourse, affirming the right of all to live freely. But why bother? Beck's use of King's pledge only makes sense if one believes that the urgent civil rights struggle of the 21st century is to liberate straight white men. In Beck's world, ridiculous as it may seem to anyone who knows much about US history, the not all that progressive Obama agenda was every bit as life-threatening and dehumanizing as was Jim Crow seg segregation. On the actual day of the 2010 Restoring Honor rally, Alveda King spoke, as did former vice presidential nominee Sarah Palin. Both praised King, Lincoln, and the Founding Fathers, advocating a return to God that would fix much of what ails Washington. But Beck also introduced members of the Black Robe Regiment, a group of religious leaders, imams, rabbis, and cler clergy committed to teaching the US's constitutional principles to their congregants. But in a day devoted to God and country, Beck still managed to plug his political agenda, suggesting that Dr. King himself would have stood against big government and lower taxes. The fact that little in King's biography supported such claims didn't matter, since few in the audience of older white men and women knew the history any better than he did. In the best case scenario, ralliers had spent the civil rights years blind to the plight of African Americans. At worst, they and their kin were actively defending the racial status quo. If many of Beck's on-air stances made him what Charles Blow called the anti-king, it didn't matter to the enthusiastic crowd he addressed. Later that night on Fox News, Beck extended his efforts to restore America's honor by questioning President Obama's moral character and religious faith. 
I don't know what that Obama's religion is other than it's not Muslim, it's not Christian, it's a perversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ as most Christians know it, unquote. This rhetoric was consistent with Beck's earlier assertions that even if Obama was not foreign born, as Berther suggested, he was, quote, hiding something fundamental about his identity, something foreign, un-American, perhaps having to do with Kenya or Karl Marx or both. It's tempting to dismiss Beck's invocation of King as simply another trick in his media arsenal, but that would be to fail to see him as a symptom of a larger trend in white discourse that bore fruit in the 2016 election and may do so again in 2024. Recall that during the 2016 presidential campaign, Ben Carson, Marco Rubio, and Ted Cruz all leaned into xenophobic, Islamophobic, and racist rhetoric, even as they asserted that their rise was thanks to the reality of equal rights made possible by the civil rights movement. They also used a defanged, inaccurate vision of the civil rights movement to bash the Black Lives Matter movement as the cause of an ongoing racial divide rather than a response to it. Meanwhile, the right and left-wing media have generally failed to interrogate ongoing examples of white racial militancy disguised as a struggle for group rights. In January 2016, an Oregon Wildlife Preserve was the site of an armed siege by anti-government militia forces led by Eamon Bundy, the sign of the son of Cliven Bundy, who successfully won an armed standoff in 2014 with the Bureau of Land Management and local law enforcement over his failure to pay a decade's worth of grazing fees. Until his arrest in February of 2016, Bundy was still grazing his cattle on public land free of charge, presumably pondering, as he did in one 2014 press conference, whether Black people were better off as slaves. The white conservative appropriation of civil rights rhetoric has facilitated the long march of white supremacy while diluting the ongoing force of the civil rights movement's structural critique of US domestic and foreign policy. And it threatens to make King a US icon without content, a historical remnant of a gone and forgotten racial past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Young, for such a wonderful talk. We have approximately 20 minutes available to Thank us you. for a Q&A. This is, there's a lot to be thinking about, and I'm guessing that our participants have <laughs> any questions to ask. There's a Q&A box uh, where you can put your questions and we'll bring them up, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we can address them. Um, I, I wanted to get us started uh, by just asking you um, if you can share a bit on the, tra the, the, the trajectory that brought you to this topic and to this research. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's striking to me, given soul power and your, your focus on artistic production, mm -hmm. on, on yeah. uh, uh, progressive youth culture and, so, and social movements and the relationship mm -hmm. to uh, anti-colonial movements outside of the United States. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really struck by this mm -hmm. position. It's a big right? shift. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about how you've... How sure. You've... Um, so, I mean, part of what I should say, oh, and I should have corrected you, I am no longer the department head of African-American studies, finally. But um, I have done a lot of administration over the last uh, sort of decade yeah. or more. Um, and so that means that the book that I thought I was going to write in a few years has been elongated um, mm -hmm. over a long period. So initially, I was very interested in popular cultures and the impact of 9-11 on it. Yeah. But then as I started, you know, as time went on and I started noticing different um, sort of things, I, I began to see a trajectory that, you know, really is over the first 20 years of the century. Um, so that's partly what happened. Um, you know, at the time I started working on him, you know, Beck was a huge figure. He's not anymore. He like tries to make himself relevant in various ways, but he has his own like network and he's, he's very, um, you know, he's very marginalized, but you know, he, he was someone who it felt important to like dig into a little bit. And then just as I was doing that work, I started, um, coming across more and more um, indications of radical right-wing extremism. And I started to just notice that there are all these investigations of so-called Islamic terrorists, none of which produced um, convictions. Mm -hmm. And yet there were these kind of armed movements of white men, and that seemed to elicit no concern um, on the part of law enforcement. Um, and just, you know, kind of 
business as usual. And so that just, uh, that kind of paradox made me think a lot more about, um, you know, how imperialism and racism come together in the US. Um, mm -hmm. So it ends up being, a, um, a lot of this book is a lot more about, <clears throat> you know, sort of white and mainstream discourse in a way that my first book was not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a second question to ask, and then we'll turn to the Q&A. Uh, and so if you do have questions, please do put them up on the Q&A, and then we'll go through them. We have about four right now. And so as we compile a bit more, we'll turn to them. But the, one of the things that really struck me was the, question, the, the quote that you, that you read from Glenn Beck, uh, quote, the man in me, like the man in me wants to bomb, right? Uh, the Middle East in reaction to 9-11. To yeah. And I was wondering if you can share with us a bit more on your, your read on the gender expression of these, of these figures, mm -hmm. right? And you're referencing a lot of white men, but in a, it seems to me like uh, some of the, their politics are in part, not only an attempt at, it, it doesn't seem, it's, it's like white victimhood, but it also seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's like male victimhood. Yeah, yeah, Overlapping. no, that's absolutely right. Yeah. That is absolutely right. Um, yeah, there's no question that that's true as well. And I think Beck is particularly interesting because he, before 9-11 even happened, he did lots of, um, you know, performances in drag, right? In vocal drag, right? Where he's playing a woman um, instead of a man, playing someone black instead of white, you know, et cetera. Um, but it's clear that once 9-11 happens, there's this kind of vacillating between these two extremes of like, you know, absolute toxic masculine um, aggression, right? And then this kind of like sensitive, wounded, tear-filled, you know, other extreme. So, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, and, you know, another version of this paper could absolutely talk about masculinity as the lens through which um, so much of this gets articulated as a way of thinking about why the excess Hollywood tape mm -hmm. had no purchase. Right. You could think about how normalized the kind of behavior was um, that that Trump engaged in by his supporters. You know, oh, it's just, you know, what people do in the locker room or men do in the locker room. Right. So, I mean, another version of this paper could absolutely do that, just as I think another version could talk specifically and only about anti-immigration politics. Um, mm -hmm you know, and really center that. I mean, part of the reason why the Tea Party takes off is that once Obama's elected, all of the anti-immigrant um, lobbying efforts move out of Washington. They're like, well, we're not gonna be successful in these next four years. Mm -hmm. And so they all go local, right? They all go, they, they sort of spread out through other states and start doing this local work. Um, and that's where you get this melange of, you know, xenophobia, nativism, racism, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like this cauldron of, you know, hatred, I guess. Um, so yeah, there, there's definitely different kinds of slices on it, for sure. Um, I think you're really right. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's go to the Q&A. Our okay. very first question is, I don't discount the role of white angst and white supremacy, but what of the alliances with and fusing with gun rights extremists? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't, I mean, you're absolutely right. There, there's no way of thinking about this that doesn't also lead to thinking about the uh, veneration of the Second Amendment and the kind of what I think is insane um, lack of restriction on guns that, you know, separates us from every other overdeveloped nation. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there's just no question that you're right about that. Um, I just didn't see in my research that as a kind of central theme. It was more an, a, just um, a casually accepted theme, right? Like, of course, you're going to have, you know, as many guns as you could possibly carry. Of course, you're going to parade around with those guns um, on, on the border. Um, but you're certainly right that it, it's absolutely, you know, linked to um, gun rights extremism. Thank you. Uh, there's a second question. While the right is hugely responsible, do you agree that the left has some role uh, as we have watched and participated in the large income inequality and the loss of jobs in the heartland? And I'm, I'm so I guess what I would Go ahead. Sorry? I, I guess I'm assuming- No, I guess what- Go ahead, sorry, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, 
I guess what I would say about that is um, I think there's a difference between uh, the kind of pro-capital politics and the pro-capitalism politics that both parties share, absolutely. Um, and, and the Democrats have a, nicely, ni a slightly nicer gloss on it. Um, they believe in the welfare state to some extent and Republicans allegedly don't except when it comes to very wealthy white men. Um, I guess I would say that in terms of in terms of really forwarding a nakedly white supremacist racist agenda, um, I would say that I think that that lies more at the feet of the the right than the left. Now, I think you could fault the left for all sorts of things, not even the left, just the Democrats um, for their inability to really play power politics, for the ways in which again and again they get punked punked by the Republicans. Like there's lots you could say about the Democrats as not much better and really ineffective as well. But I, I don't think this particular strain of political discourse um, and extremism can really be laid at their door. Thank you. Uh, this one is in some ways related to this question. Does it seem correct to say that many right-wing provocateurs really believe that they're punching up and not punching down when they attacked or deride LGBTQ feminists and anti-racist targets uh, that they believe sincerely or that they think the reins of power are now in the hands, not of corporations and WAPs, but of academics and people of color. How did they come to this odd perception of who has the power today? And in some ways, uh, you know, do you agree that this is a perception that actually exists among the populations that you're studying? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say is I take them at their deeds and not their words. So I think they're punching, they're equal opportunity punchers. They're punching up, they're punching down, they're punching all around um, in, in the sense of um, they, like I, can read economic reports, they can read health disparity reports, they can read all of the things that show them that um, BIPOC um, are not uniquely enfranchised and well off, right? So they, they, they know that. Um, I think it's much more about the cultural war that they're waging mm -hmm. um, and the ways in which certain, well, once Roe v. Wade is overturned, which I think is eminent, they're not gonna have that in the same way as an issue. And so, you know, critical race theory um, which is just another way of getting at anti-Black racism um, from a slightly different vantage point, because I don't think most people who say they oppose it even know what it is. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would say that it's it's about um, a culture war that they're waging. Um, and this kind of populism, this faux populism, I guess, um, that pretends that it is in the interests of the working people, but instead you know, continues to propagate um, policies that don't actually benefit the working people. Um, you know, and that can also be said for Democrats. It's not like we've done such, you know, Democrats have done such a great job at, you know, eradicating inequality. But I think you have to say that just looking at the response to the pandemic, um, that the right has been forced into, the Republicans have been forced into um, aid, um, to people and you know eviction moratoriums and those kinds of things in a way that the Democrats seem more comfortable with um, you know forging ahead with those kinds of um, things. So I think it's really more about cu cultural um, politics than it is that they actually believe um, you know that I am uniquely powerful in the world or something. The final question that we have here. Uh, I think you in some ways have answered it, but uh, do you think that some people have different levels of ability for critical thinking? Or is it a symptom of structural oppression that fosters lack of critical thinking, which also serves the perpetuation of structural oppressions? Um, and for this person, the question emerged from the idea that Tea Partiers felt that they lost the United States that made sense to them, quote, quote unquote, uh, the inability to make sense of structural oppression even in their own thinking. So in some sense, the, the, the person is wondering whether or not um, there's an incapacity uh, among the population at play. Yeah. So why? That, I mean, I think that's, I think that's a really um, 
important question. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of ways you could answer it. So you could talk about the defunding of public schools and the impact that that has on education, you know, broadly speaking. You could talk about the privatization of education and the impact that that has on critical thinking. Because if you are getting to college when you finally start thinking um, critically, mm -hmm. then, you know, that's a lot of wasted opportunity. Let's just put it that way. So I think that's some of what's going on. I think, um, to put it very bluntly, racism works best when it is invisible to the people who don't, who aren't its targets. That's mm -hmm. the way I guess I would put that. You know, that's precisely why segregation is so very effective, right? Because when you have no interaction with people of different backgrounds, then you make up all sorts of stories in your head about what they do, what they like, that they're good parents, that they're bad parents, you know, whatever it is. Um, and that's, um, and from your vantage point, you know, if you apply for a job and you're a white person and you get it, you don't see the kind of racial and gender privilege, if you're a man, that has made that possible because it's always been there. So I think some of it is also just that the system is working the way it's designed to work, which is to be invisible to people who want its targets and to make a structural critique of inequality very, very difficult to mount um, because it's invisible, but also because it seems overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. People are going about the day-to-day -day business of raising families and working and going to school and you know doing all the things that they're doing. And you know, most people don't sit around abstractly thinking about, they don't have the luxury of sitting around abstractly thinking about uh, these kinds of issues, particularly if they don't pertain to them. Um, you know, a lot of what the first book was about was the fact that these were organic intellectuals, right? These were people who looked around, <laughs> who looked around at their conditions mm -hmm. and could see they were being exploited. Mm -hmm. They didn't need to read Marx to know that. They could see they were being exploited. They could also see that collective um, power kind of leveled the playing field in terms of dealing mm -hmm. with their employers. Again, they didn't need to go to labor and employment relations school to find that out. They, they, they actually, and they could see the link between the fact that they made so little money and the fact that their kids were in crummy schools and the fact that they lived in terrible public housing, right? They could see the connection between those things. Um, and so I think it's also partly that you, you make history from where you're standing, right? Mm -hmm. You, you make sense of your world from your vantage point. Um, you know, in some ways, you're kind of thrust into being a critical thinker when you are, you know, the most oppressed. I see this all the time with my kids, mm -hmm. um, where they will just watch something or see something, and they understand because they have grown up in this soup of anti-black racism. Mm -hmm. One of the striking things about your first book, however, was also about the attempts by these organic intellectuals to see difference and to see other people in other conditions and try mm -hmm. to attend to the differences as opposed to absorb mm -hmm. the conditions mm -hmm. of other people mm -hmm. in their language right. or to claim the mantle of their freedom right. projects as their own. So for instance, yeah. like the Cuban revolution, right? In the, the Black mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this case, it seems to me like part of what the person is asking is that, is there almost an incapacity to see difference mm -hmm. Uh, you know, one can one can live in a, a, a particular soup, right, of anti-blackness, but right. also right. Absor observe the conditions of others as as the folks that you're, yeah. you're describing here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, we have seven minutes, and I was I was hoping we have students on this on this um, on this um, uh, um, uh, series, and I was wondering if you can share with us how now that you've been quote unquote, liberated from some of the administrative work, right? Uh, where do you see your research going? How do you see it developing into the second book? What are your plans uh, moving forward? Yeah, so I, I have one more chapter to write of the book out of which this talk um, emerged. Mm -hmm. um, and that's gonna be on Obama and actually foreign policy. So it's gonna talk a lot about drone politics and his terrible anti-immigration politics and how to sort of make sense of that um, at the same time as he was so linked to 
um, the realization of the civil rights dream. So that's that's that chapter. Um, but then I I think I'm going to play a little bit more. Like this book was very you know intense. It's very disturbing. It's very difficult labor. Um, and so the next book is going to be, um, or the next work, I don't know if it'll end up being a book, is going to be on the 1980s um, and Black American and Black British culture, um, particularly film um, and the kind of rise of British cultural studies. Uh, I've just been interested in that for a long time. So that's sort of one, um, one series of things. And then the other is a... Um, a collection of essays on African diasporic um, cultural production. And that is um, the first piece of that um, is something I've written on Atlantiques, uh, which is a film by Mati Diop, who is um, Senegalese um, and French. And um, it's about the migration politics, about um, you know people setting out in desperate circumstances in rickety boats who don't make it and how, how the people they leave behind sort of deal with that. So that's, that's the next work um, once this is sort of off my plate. Um, but yeah, so, back, so in a way back more to my roots in the sense of mm -hmm. you know, film, music, mm -hmm. literature. Um, you know, I've kind of gotten pretty far away from being, I mean, I am a cultural historian in this book, but not so much um, a, a literary or cultural analyst in the same way. And I sort of miss it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine, right, to make a pivot mm -hmm. in a different direction. Uh, or do you have any advice for uh, graduate students or mm -hmm. undergraduate students who are doing their research or beginning research, especially on topics that deal with uh, overt racism, misogyny, homophobia? Mm -hmm. like a lot of these uh, topics that are that can wear on on the person. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's important to have, you know, things that take you away from the work, right? And that's that's true no matter what the work is. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I give myself permission to enjoy, you know, anti-terrorist TV shows, even though I have really well well worn and full blown critiques of them. Um, you know, I think it's important to be able to kind of shut it off a little bit um, at times and just enjoy the things you enjoy, whatever that might be. Um, so I think that that's one thing. I think it's important to have support networks, um, you know, people who are doing similar kind of work because that can also be really helpful. And that's the great thing about graduate school is that you have this cohort of people who are going through the same things you are and interested in many of the same ideas and themes and thinkers that you are. So I think that's another thing is to really make community um, in graduate school, which is harder to do than it was as an undergraduate, I think, um, because you're not in big classes and you know all the things that, that we sort of know distinguish the two. Um, so I, I guess those are the main things. I think that the first book I wrote was very much a kind of exploration of the civil rights movement and transnational activism from the perspective of what kind of world people imagined, right? Like what was the world they wanted to build? It was also a critique of the world they were in, sure, but it also allowed them to make various kinds of solidarities, alliances, um, critiques uh, in a way that was ultimately somewhat liberating um, to them. And that's, I think, something that you have to sort of constantly at least think about as maybe the other side of the project that you're, that you're doing. So it's like, you know, on the one hand, you're thinking a lot about misogyny, for example. Well, it's also an opportunity for you to think about the things that have emerged um, in response to it, right? And how those things have sustained generations of, of people who've been combating the same things. So I think that, I mean, I, that was really helpful for me to be reminded of when Trump was elected, because, you know, you talk to historians, you talk to people who live through Jim Crow, it's like, this is nothing new. Like we've been here before and we're still here and they're not, um, you know, until they are again. And then we fight the same battles again. Um, so, I guess that's that's the perspective that I've tried to keep, even when I've been doing really 
kind of grueling, maddening work um, is that there is a different world that people are fighting for. There is a different space that people inhabit. There are ways to inhabit those spaces, even amidst the kind of unbelievable oppression that you know we're currently living with. Thank you so much, Professor Young. I think we're at time. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Thank you for oh, thank you for your Appreciate answers it. to our questions, uh, for sharing uh, your research with us. Uh, this uh, and I want to. Uh, this is again uh, the race, ethnicity, and immigration colloquium. I forget <laughs> with the Institute of Graduate uh, Institute of Governmental Studies at Berkeley, and we are being co-sponsored by the Ethnic Studies Department and the Center for Race and Ethnic uh, Race and Gender. It is being recorded, so it'll be available to those of you who would like to watch it again. I want to thank uh, Megan Collins. Uh, tech wizard yep. right, that helped out both with the, the presentation and with getting this thing going. I'm, I'm very much a, a Luddite uh, academic and I feel like I want to create an organization for anti-technology professors, um, but not for her, we wouldn't have this. Um, with that, uh, we will please join our listserv or I don't know, I think we have a listserv or just go to our website and, and join whatever it is that we have. Uh, we'll, we have three more speakers next uh, for next semester, all of whom are going to have wonderful talks on questions of race, ethnicity, and immigration. And so with that, uh, thank you, and we'll, we'll end the talk now. Okay, thank you, Professor Young again. Thank you.